The system you don't accept is the one that will nurture you faster. The stars that rule the whole world, all this astrology, it's just astro, it's astral. But there is something there deep in nirvana that is yet to be understood. Actually, we don't need anything because there is a universal soul. It's us. Master, I am practicing 42 kriyas and losing weight. Is that normal? This is not losing weight, the word should be changed here. It's just the body readjusting itself. The fact is that energization of the body is connected with the work of the whole body system, not only physically, but also etherically, astrally. These are delicate processes. Here the body energies, dosha, are involved. The body has three doshas, you know? It's bile, mucus, and the wind. This is what our body consists of. When the system is worked out well, the energies are realigned at the level of these three doshas. The constitution of the body changes. Naturally, the weight can go away. That happens quite quickly. There is a case when people lose 10 kilograms in about two weeks. It happens. By the way, this happens under stress. A man got stressed out, a few days later he's five or six kilograms off. It is a critical situation when a person loses five to six kilograms in one day, but it does happen. Then he recovers. Are there times when a spiritual practice doesn't fit a person's life or just is not necessary? There's no such case. Because everything you encounter in life is there for you. If you've met someone who doesn't like you, someone you detest, but you've encountered them anyway, can you say that this person is not for you? You've met them. Why have you met them? Because you haven't completed something with them. You have a sensation that comes out of your spiritual world, your inner world. I don't like this goose. I don't like him. I don't trust him. I've looked at the person and I know right away there's something wrong with him. In fact, you're not aware of it with your mind, but in reality there are sensations. So what's the problem? People jump to conclusions without realizing that this goose is the closest of all the geese, of the whole flock. You see why? Because he's the one who will make you learn to love much faster. Both yourself and all the other geese. Same with the system. If, say, I tell you that you should practice 42 Kriyas, and you say, not you personally, but in general, I don't feel like practicing 42 Kriyas, I'm more into meditation. The man is a slacker, he just wants to sit and do nothing. And he presents it as, these 42 Kriyas don't suit me. Because we have to work hard. I say, okay, then there is another option. Would an hour of walking in circles, Chinese martial arts style instead of energizing be okay? Oh, well, is there anything else? There are so many more, but there is work to be done everywhere. The system you don't accept, I'm speaking in general, not literally, is exactly the one that would nurture you faster. Now ask the question again. I don't have any more questions. Got it, right? Everything we encounter in life is there for us. It stands for something in our lives. If you encounter an event that you don't want to mess with, and that event has arisen, then it needs to be addressed. That's what this is about. If it were that simple, you could pretty much do it all at once. Just like that. But for some reason, it doesn't work that way. And why? Because we have a certain body here who is not your body at all. That's our mind. It has blocking there already. Remember the example I told you before. The concept in some schools is you need to come to liberation. There is a concept of coming to liberation. What does the mind decide for itself in that moment? Oh, I should come to liberation. That's a long way to go. There is a liberation that lies ahead. 
There's me who doesn't know anything. They tell me, you have to be wise, you have to be good, you have to watch your feelings, you have to watch your mind, and someday you will come to liberation. There's a distance created, and that distance is just here, it doesn't really exist. It's a hoax, a deception that is built by our own minds. Moreover, the irony is that you are using the same mind in an attempt to circumvent it. Your own mind is trying to outsmart itself. And it tells you, so I'm enlightened, I already know everything, I have understood it all. Some people ask me a question, some serious question. But I can see that he's asking it to demonstrate his worth, that he's versed in the issue. And the question is a deep one, requiring a long answer, even longer than I'm talking now. This person listening to me, pretending to listen, is already thinking about what they would ask next. Without hearing the rest of it, he says, I got it, and asks a completely different question. So this person is not in the process. Why? Because his mind is not in process. Because his goal was not to learn, but to show. When a philosopher, an esotericist under a certain circumstance, stands in a trench and digs, takes clay with a shovel, a wet clay, and throws it, a genius, a philosopher of a very high level, an academian, a professor, but he stands in a trench and digs, because that's the way it is, that's fate. Is this something really bad for him, or is it a lack of spiritual practice? In terms of truth, no, because for him there is a spiritual practice in it. He can continue to be a philosopher while still mechanically digging the trench. He may think of his highest ideas, but at the same time, if he doesn't like the shovel and what he is doing, his spiritual practice is to accept the situation wholeheartedly. If, for example, you have the opportunity to meet people who will give you an understanding of what you are in terms of design, taking some steps towards self-development in design, reaching the same goals and heights as in yoga, then you can move there freely. But there are no such people, because design is just the ethereal astral part. There are no great realizations, and yoga has them. Moreover, I'll tell you that design, various other systems, as well as astrology, essentially are just the astral level. It gives an understanding of the world order, of the picture, of the person, and so on, but this is the etheric astral level. The stars that rule the whole world, all this astrology, it's just astro, it's astral. And the whole earth moves under these stars, but all the people in this Mrityu Loka, which is the mortal world, are influenced by astrology in one way or another. Or karma. But if you practice yoga, you rise above that karmic component, you rise above yourself. There's a saying, the stars rule fools, and wise men rule their stars. From this premise, yoga is universal. When I say yoga, I don't mean Hinduism, just so you understand. I'm not religious at all. It's not about Hinduism at all, but Hinduism is convenient. It explains the level of understanding and consciousness quite lucidly. So is Buddhism, by the way. They're the same, there's just two polarities. In Hinduism, more attention is given to the person of God or the gods, to some levels, to some aspects. This is not polytheism, just the qualities of God. And in Buddhism, more focus is given to the principle of oneness and the absence of personhood and attachment as such. Generally, Buddhism is thought to have emerged as the other side of the coin or scale for balance. Generally, Buddhism is thought to have emerged as the other side of the coin or the scale cup for balance. Therefore, there is no personality in Buddhism, as they see it. 
A few years ago, we had an audience with the Dalai Lama. Not our last one, but some time ago. It was 2012, if I'm not mistaken. There were very many hours of conversation. It was very cold outside, and a huge number of people were sitting around. In Drumsala, where the Dalai Lama the 14th lives. Do you know who the Dalai Lama is? It happened to be that he blessed our group. He came out so happy, approached us. Everyone had left for lunch, it was very cold outside, and we, 12 to 13 of us, practiced Kriya right there. So we didn't go off to eat anywhere for a break, we just stayed there in practice. Some monks stayed there at the site. Suddenly the Dalai Lama comes out and says, Oh, what kind of people are these that stayed out here in this cold? He approached us. We stood up, of course, and he blessed everyone. Why am I telling you all this? Then the second part of the exercise began. He said an interesting thing. Everyone says the most important concept in Buddhism is nirvana. But I'm going to tell you something. The thing I never said before, he said the following. There, deep in nirvana, there is something yet to be understood. Nirvana is not the final destination. That's him talking about Buddhism. He completely destroyed the concept of Buddhism. People, and there were maybe a few thousand people sitting here, their hair just stood on end. How come? He said that nirvana is not the final destination, that there is something deep there that is yet to be understood. He laughed in his own way and went on break again. So it all depends on perception. Human design, just like human astro design, there are a huge number of other variants. Feng Shui, Ba Tzu, anything goes in there. All these are elements that are a collective image. In fact, we don't need anything, because there is a universal soul. To answer your question, and it's a serious question, a human doesn't need anything. The only thing necessary is to choose any religious practice. It could be Islam, Christianity, Hesychasm. It could be anything. Sufism. In this case, it's Kriya Yoga. That's for one purpose only. To realize what you really are. Not to get you to who you are by using any particular individual systems, but to immediately turn on a mechanism that gives you an understanding of who you are. That's it. That's where the song ends. That's where the development ends in general. If you realize right now that you are Atman, you don't need to do anything else. A short second I am experience. There is nothing more needed. One day you will hear who you really are. You will see and hear, seeing and feeling this sound of Nada, Brahma Nada. When you realize that you are Brahma Nada, Brahmanada is the sound of Brahma, it is the vibration of the Creator Himself. All other things are no longer needed. This is the end of life, the ordinary life. But you'll have to learn to live if you still want to be here. We'll have to learn to walk again. I've had this experience. I had to find the motivation to figure out why I wanted to walk this earth, why I wanted to interact with people and so on. Master, you entered the Samadhi. How did you get out of this state? Before entering Samadhi, the keys to exit Samadhi are provided. Because you can't leave a Samadhi unless you have keys. You express the intention that you will return. You make a promise to yourself, to your Higher Self. So there is a need to come back because there is a promise. Any promise you made and did not keep, you will have to fulfill even in the next life. So don't make promises unless you're ready to keep them. And as of today, if we're talking about moving forward, that's basically what you're here for. You have a great desire to achieve something. In addressing you, I would like to ask you to visualize or decide very clearly for yourself what you want. Because most of you don't really know what you want. There is some imaginary understanding of the need to reach Samadhi. 
And the phrase one must attain samadhi has a major keyword in it. Is it really necessary? Do you really need it though? What for? What are you going to do about it? Are you ready? I told you, I have a friend who asked to be liberated, and he was withering away before my eyes. I couldn't figure out what the reason was. He's dying, sitting there in the chair, his arms, legs don't function anymore. A month, two, three go by. He was a big, burly man before. His wife complains that he's not working, he's getting weaker, there's no telling what it is. It was back in the 1990s. I couldn't figure out what was going on. I meditated, I pondered, I contemplated. Then I suddenly wanted to go see him again. I was checking up on him. And he developed pulmonary emphysema. We just came from Puttaparthi. He lives in Dagestan. He's fine now, thank God. What is happening to you? He says, I don't know, I'm barely there anymore. There's no apparent reason for such a disease to occur. There really were some lung problems, but not as severe. I was sitting there thinking, thinking, what on earth is going on? Then I suddenly asked him a question. What do you ask of God? And his face changed as he clenched his fists as hard as he could. I'm asking him for liberation. I'm asking him, but I'm getting worse and worse. You fool, what are you asking for? You're going to die in a little while. You ask for liberation, but are you ready for that liberation? And then he realized that he was asking the wrong thing. He asked for liberation, but he sees a nine and Sai Baba sees a six. Do you get it? So determine what you want. Because as long as you have maybe an amorphous sort of concept of God, who is God? What's He like for you? When I say God, all you feel is the presence of God. Everyone, however, has their own images of the perception of the Divine. Who is this God to you? How do you see Him? Is it Buddha, Krishna, Brahma, some image? Is it light or is it nothing? What is it? You have to define it for yourself. Who is Allah? For Muslims. Everyone says he was not born, he does not exist, yet he does, and so on. That is an abstract idea. Then he doesn't exist if you can't visualize him. How can you see him? How can you? Like energy. But what is energy? Probably it's life. Then you imagine God is life. A whole wave of life images should rush through your mind right away. Social life, namaz, spiritual life, kriya yoga life, dining life, children life, husband life, and so on. God is everything in space. That's right, correct. It's a collective image. You say the right thing, but I want you to understand specifically what is the image for you that you will focus your energy on and that will begin to work with you? Does everyone have their own image? That's up to you. I can't advise here. Master, can the mantra be the name of God? Of course, that's what the mantra is. What is a mantra anyway? Man is the mind and tra is protection, mind protection. If you recite the name of God, the sacred name, let's say Sai or Shiv or Hri, which is basically Christ, or Isa or Isha, Jesus was called Isa. That's Shiva's name, by the way. Jesus was a Shiavite. Few people know that. You certainly fall within the realm of that Loka or Svarga. There are levels of consciousness. It's kind of like worlds. You get to the place that the vibration of that name corresponds to. So the name should be liberating, or the mantra should be liberating. There are not many liberating mantras. There is a Gayatri mantra. It is considered a liberating mantra in Hinduism. Mantra Om Namah Shivaya in Hinduism, in Vedantism. By and large, it's not just Hinduism. It's an even more encompassing perception. It's liberating too. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya is also considered a liberating one. La Ilya Ilyaya is also considered liberating. Allah Hum is also considered liberating. Om Mani Padme Hum in Buddhism, if you please. Om Ahum Vajra Guru Padme Siddhi Hum is also considered liberating. They are many. Enough, but not as much as we'd like. The other mantras are auxiliary for some purpose. 
to achieve some mercantile interests of their own from a spiritual viewpoint, but still interests. For example, if you pray Siddhi Datri, you want to purchase Siddhi. You pray to the aspect of Parvati or Durga in the form of Siddhi Datri, and you acquire Siddhi, superpowers. Either you want health, you turn to Danvantari, and he gives you health. Assuming, of course, you do it all right. This is not liberation, it is an achievement. But there's a universal one. Again, we have to realize if we are reciting a liberating mantra, then you have to be ready for liberation. If liberation for you is about superpowers, powers that you want to manifest in this life to help the world, but in fact you want to just manifest yourself, I'm not talking about you now, I'm talking about me. Suppose a man is misled, he says, I want to be a superhero. Like Batman, but like Maha Batman, so he levitates and saves everyone, helps everyone. It's a good wish. There's nothing wrong with that, really. But when you start reciting the mantra that liberates, your wings will fall off, your head will drop. He says, I wanted to be Batman to help the world, to free it from demons and so on, but the strength I have is diminishing. Get the concept of liberation right. Like with that guy, my friend. By the way, that was the very fellow I was talking about who asked to be liberated, but dreamed of being liberated in his lifetime. He wanted to be a superhero to himself in a good way, but he was asking for the wrong thing. This is the guy I saw Babaji with in the mountains. Please tell me, what can I ask of the Creator to live a true life rather than for my ego? Addressing the Heavenly Father or the Creator, the Absolute, you can say the following. Let me live this life in such a way that my soul is fully satisfied and that the truth I seek is clear to me, and that you personally guide the process so that I may be useful to you in this life. Your question has the answer already. It's simple. You don't have to come up with anything. Be honest to yourself. If you want superpowers, ask for superpowers. If you want to be healthy, ask for health. If you don't have an understanding, I'm not talking about particularly you right now, of the right way to ask, then ask sincerely. Do you really think God doesn't know what you want? He knows everything. Moreover, the very desire to ask is His desire. It's just that it's all inspired by the one Creator that is expressed in you. He is now creating the conditions whereby you, finding yourself in those conditions, are forced to ask Him in Himself. That's the kind of game that's going on. Because when we set apart, and we have a sense that God is there and we are here, then we are able to ask. In order to realize that it's not that God is there but we are here, is that He's right here. All processes happen within us. When you ask for anything, add the word within me. This is important. I want to achieve something or other. I want to feel you. I want to understand the truth within me. Because when you don't spell out the word within to yourself, you are then modeling all that somewhere in space. And you have to march towards that again, because a distance has appeared. It's here. But when you say within, you are putting it all inside of you at once. Then these processes take place within you. This is important. If you have a strong conviction that it is already within you, then there is no need to say it out loud. This would be enough.